Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Brevda. I'm the Senior Manager for Education and Accessibility at the Museum at Eldridge Street. Thank you so much for joining us for this Zoom program with Rabbi Paula Drill. I am turning on live captioning, uh, which is powered by AI, so apologies in advance if there are any uh, incorrect uh, any errors. Uh, as we go through the uh, program, uh, we will have opportunities uh, for questions. Uh, you can uh, either enable your uh, microphone to speak directly, or if you prefer, you can put your questions in the chat and I'll be able to read them at the end of the program. For those of you who haven't visited us before, the museum at Eldridge Street is housed in the Eldridge Street Synagogue. Built in 1887, it was the first grand synagogue built by Eastern European Jews in the United States. The grand building was nearly lost to neglect in the mid 20th century before the museum's massive restoration project returned the space to its former glory and for public use. We offer both per, uh, in virtual and in-person programming uh, that explore the uh, history of immigrant life on the Lower East, East, East Side, architecture, historic preservation, and inspire reflection on cultural exchange and continuity. You can find all of our public programming listed on our website at eldridgestreet.org slash events. I do want to take a moment as, as part of this introduction to just mention some of our exciting upcoming programming, in particular, our concert this uh, Christmas coming Christmas Day, which is going to be a fusion of uh, a combination of Jewish klezmer and Chinese folk music. It's going to be fantastic. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fantastic. And there are a whole bunch of fantastic Chinese restaurants in the neighborhood to make a perfect Jewish Christmas. Uh, for this program this morning, I also want to take a moment to thank Dr. Nevins, not only for leading this program, which is the last in a four-part virtual series on Aging Well, but for organizing the entire project, including the in-person panel discussion that we held on November 19th and producing this virtual series, where we've been joined by experts who will discuss religious, medical, and ethical dimensions of aging. These virtual seminars have been held weekly on Wednesdays at 11, and this is our last session. For anyone who's uh, hadn't, hadn't, hadn't been able to attend the prior sessions, don't worry. We'll be sending recordings of all the virtual programming for those who have registered for this program today. Uh, next, I'd just like to take a moment and introduce Dr. Nevins to you all, and he in turn will introduce Rabbi Gill. Dr. Michael Nevins is a retired internist cardiologist who practiced for nearly four decades at North, in Northern New Jersey. He grew up in the Bronx, graduated from Dartmouth College and Tufts Medical School, and was active in bioethics, geriatrics, and medical education. You can read more about Dr. Nevins and his work on michaelnevinsmd.com. Doctor, I will hand it over, the program over to you. Great. Thank you, Scott. And special thanks to Bonnie Dimon and Maya Locker, who uh, helped plan and orchestrated uh, these programs. Uh, in a way, I'm sorry, this is the last of the series of uh, five events, and um, I just want to very briefly uh, introduce our, our guest this morning, and that is Rabbi Paula MacDrill, and her focus will be upon spirituality, uh, whatever that means, we'll soon find out as it relates to old age. So Rabbi Drill is one of three rabbis at, of the Orangetown Jewish Center in Orangeburg, New York. Um, she served there for her entire rabbinic career, which is over 20 years. She originally began as a social worker, but after a dozen years in that field, she received a Wexner Foundation graduate fellowship, uh, returned to Jewish the, the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and from there, she was ordained as a conservative rabbi in 2004. And currently, Rabbi Drill uh, is president of the Rockland County Board of Rabbis. And she also serves on the Rockland Pride Center. And she even is a certified yoga instructor. So that covers a lot of ground. And her passions include making Torah accessible for all and striving to create inclusive communities and performing social justice work. So she's a busy gal. And she and her husband are the proud parents of four adult children and two grandchildren. And so we're delighted that she's agreed to share her wisdom and her light uh, with us this morning. So with that in mind, Paula, welcome and Thank you're you. on. Thank you. Thanks so much. 
If you know Dr. Michael Nevins, you know you never say no to him. You only say, yes, 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 I'll do whatever you ask me to do. Um, thank you for that really nice introduction. I'll just add that I am now the proud bubby of three grandchildren. My daughter and son-in-law had a new child, Geffen Nadav, born on um, the UN Partition Day, November 29th. Um, so we have a brand new baby, and that's pretty exciting in our family as well. I'm really, really happy to be here. There's no pressure. Dr. Nevin said that I should work very hard to leave everyone with an uplift at the end of today, which I actually think will not be a problem because you clearly already know how to grow older without growing old. Why? You're here to learn today. So curiosity is one of the key components of aging well. I always like to say that getting older is a blessing, right? You get another day, that is your blessing. Getting older is a blessing and it's going to happen if you're lucky. Growing old is a choice. So let's investigate that together today. Um, if you're eating a brunch or um, you're dusting while you're listening to the class, feel free to keep your video off. But if you feel comfortable, it helps the teacher a little bit to see who I'm talking to. So if you feel comfortable letting your um, letting your video show, uh, that is great for me. No, no big pressure, but it, it is nice to teach to faces um, here on Zoom. I'm going to read you something to begin. It's a, a really lovely poem called Some Days It's Like This. But as I'm reading it to you, I have an opening question for everyone here, which you can throw into the chat or you can even unmute when I'm done with a poem to tell me the answer. But I am curious, what about the description of this class today encouraged you to sign up for it. Um, maybe you just took all four classes and this is part of the series, but if this class in particular, an idea of spiritual aging, of aging well from the soul kind of floated your boat and encouraged you to sign up, let me know why. I'm going to read this poem for you. It's by a poet named Rosemary Watola Tromer. And it's called, Some Days It's Like This. Today, it is impossible. Sorry, let me start again. Today, it is somehow easy to know I will die. Meeting mortality feels as possible, as natural as inviting someone over for tea. Caffeine or no caffeine, I ask. Mortality shrugs as if it's all the same. I settle on the new tea I bought yesterday, Assam, with rose petals. It's dark and floral and makes the mouth come alive. You're really not afraid of me today? Mortality asks. I shrug and say, not right now. We sip from our cups and stare out at the field where the wind is whipping the tall grasses in rhythmic pulses. It's good, says Mortality. I nod. And we sit in content silence. There just isn't much to say. When our cups are empty, mortality doesn't leave. It occurs to me then my Im invitation to tea wasn't necessary. Mortality was already here. It moves with me as I rise to clear the dishes, as I wash the cups, as I walk out into the wind, into the field. So I leave you with that and um, just wondering if anyone wants to offer a suggestion about why you're here today to learn about spiritually aging well. Like what is it about this topic? You can uh, wave an electronic hand. You can put something in the chat. You can just unmute and say if you'd like to, I'll give just a half a minute in case someone wants to say why you signed up for today. Okay, shy learners, that's all right, that's all right. Um, if something occurs, you wanna throw it into the chat? Margot took all four, the series was planned to be a holistic approach to aging, right? So. So you've, <laughs> I like that. You've taken care of the body, mind, and now the spirit, right? 
That's a perfect way to put it. Thank you. That's great. I wanted to start today. I couldn't resist because this week's Torah portion is just there for the taking in terms of spiritual aging, because this is the Torah portion, Vayigash. We're right in the middle of the Joseph Chronicles. If any of you are Torah readers, you know that these weeks of Joseph's story are very full columns in the Torah. There's no break. You have to be work ahead of time to find out where you're going to begin reading the next week because just one column runs into another, letting us all know that this story has one beginning and one end, though it really is spread out over four Shabbatot, four weeks. In this week, Joseph sends word to Jacob. He has now revealed himself. He says, just come. You can live safely in Egypt. There'll be plenty for you to eat. And as soon as Jacob arrives, the first thing Joseph can't wait to do, it's kind of like if you've ever gone to work with your children and they can't wait to introduce you to their boss, Joseph takes dad immediately to Pharaoh to introduce. And Pharaoh looks at Jacob and the first thing out of his mouth is, how old are you? What a strange, what a strange question to ask someone upon first meeting them. Pharaoh says, how old are you? And the commentary says, well, Pharaoh looked into Jacob's face. He saw weariness and disappointment, regret and grief that made him look well beyond his years. And we can think back on Jacob's life and understand why his face had aged. I like to think his eyes had been deadened somewhat by living for so many years, assuming that his beloved child was no longer alive. And the shock of realizing that he's alive having lost all those years in the middle, it made him look just very elderly, well beyond his years. The rabbis say he should have lived to 180, but he only lived to 147. So today we're not hoping for 180. I don't think anyone here wants to live that long. I don't. We're not even hoping for 147, though it could be that my grandchildren, by the time they age, Dr. Nevins can correct me, but I think we're going to have enough bionic um, things that maybe people will live that long. But we, I hope, would like our faces to show contentment, to show our wisdom, to show even happiness or acceptance of our lives. I wonder if our faces as mirrored in our eyes could show that we believe the best is yet to be, which to me is a measure of wise aging. And you may say, lady, you don't know about my arthritic fingers. You don't know about the loss I've experienced. You don't know that I used to run marathons and now it's hard for me to walk around the park. All that is true. And still, I'm going to offer to you today that the best, I believe, can be yet to come. So, before I continue and share my first text with you, if you have a pen and a scrap of paper around anything to write with, I encourage you to write down the following. It's three things. My three greatest hopes for the way I continue my life are. Three things. Your three greatest hopes for the way you'll be continuing your life. What are they? And anyone who's very courageous can throw them into the chat and let us all uh, learn from you your three greatest hopes. Maybe they're reasonable, maybe they're not even reasonable, but go ahead and try to list them out. While you're writing that list, I'm just going to put my first text up onto the screen for everybody. I hope you can see it. It's telling me I'm screen sharing. I know that I am. So this first text um, comes from Stanley Kunitz. I assume this is a crowd um, who, who knows Stanley Kunitz. He was an author. He was twice the Poet Laureate for the National Library. He lived until 100. So I like to say he knew what he was talking about. He died in 2006. His poetry is something that gives me a great deal of pleasure. And this is something that he said that I think 
of course he was Jewish, um, is very, very Jewish. He wrote, years ago, I came to the realization that the most poignant of all lyrical tension stems from the awareness that we are living and dying at once. To embrace such knowledge and yet to remain compassionate and whole, that is the consummation of the endeavor of art. So he's talking clearly about the endeavor of his art, which was writing. I'd like to offer that for me, it's the art of living a good life, a meaningful life, a life that you take pleasure in every day. And perhaps if you made a list of three greatest hopes, um, Margot offered purpose, love, and contribution. Wow, she took a page right out of my book. I think that would be... <laughs> exactly where I would sit. Thank you for offering that. Um, his his idea of endeavor of art, I think, applies to all of life. That holding the tension between knowing that we're dying and insisting on living is the key to living wisely, aging wisely, bringing to fruition all the goodness that has been in our life. And it's very Jewish. You know, the rabbis say, live every day as if it's your last. That's not to be depressing. That's to be engaged in this life, to continue, to insist on seeing every day as a gift. It's easy enough to wake up in the morning and feel your pains and feel your aches and your disappointments, to turn on the radio station to all that is difficult and go about your day after a cup of coffee. It is also very possible to wake up every morning and change that radio dial and tune into Moda'ani Lifanecha Melech Kayam, right? How grateful I am, God, that you've given me another day to stand before you with purpose, with love, and the ability to contribute as Margot has offered. So today, what I hope we're going to do is take last week's class which was about end of life. And Dr. Nevin said, quite a depressing conversation. Take that same conversation and say, I can turn this into a positive. I can say by knowing that my life has an end line, I am going to instead make every day worth something. Of course, this assumes mental, physical, and spiritual health. And I want to acknowledge from the very beginning that people on this screen may themselves be dealing with very difficult medical conditions, may have people in their immediate life going through emotional difficulties, dementia, all the things that make what I'm saying really difficult. And yet, I think I'm going to conclude today with all of you hopefully standing with me saying, it's a choice. We can spiritually age with purpose, love, and contribution to the world at large. So I guess I would say ignoring our mortality is not only convenient, but it's what many of us do every single day. It's just too hard to wake up every day and think, wow, there's less of my life ahead of me than behind me, or every single person I love is leaving me. Um, I I had a grandfather, Lou, he lived to 98. Um, my two first grandbabies are named for him. The middle name is Lewis because he was an enormous force in our life. And grandpa Lou used to say, I live to tell the story. And also his whole life died around him. No one of his generation was left by the time he left us at 98. My grandmother had gone, his two daughters had gone, his siblings, he had nine siblings, right? And still he felt, I live to tell the story. He found a way to feel that he had purpose and contribution. And here he is still impacting lives, you know, some 15 years after he died. So what is our purpose? I'm going to just jump on Margot's words. What is our purpose? Knowing Jewishly that we're partners with God, that we are meant to be kind 
to others, kindness is not a weakness, it's a superpower. It is a superpower and all of Jewish tradition rests upon the golden rule, just like every other religion, right? Do not do unto others what you would not have done to yourself means that you have to love yourself first, be kind to yourself in order to engage in that superpower of being kind to others. And I actually think that's why God chose us to be partners with God. We have the capacity for kindness and the final superpower to be reverent of life, to cherish life. And by life, I mean a life with integrity and meaning and purpose and the ability to contribute. Judaism says run after life, pursue life, but it doesn't say pursue heartbeat or pursue brainwaves. It says pursue life. So um, I want to just share one of my mantras. I'm going to come back to the screen probably you know this mantra as well. It's from Psalm 90, one of my favorites. And it says in the Hebrew, Limnot yamenu ken hodav en navi levav chokma. Teach us to number our days that we may attain a heart of wisdom. Levav chokma, a heart of wisdom. Not teach us to number our days so that we can gather the most stuff, have more houses than anyone else we know, um, have more um, money in the bank, though certainly it makes our lives easy and reduces, I guess, anxiety. Of course it does. But a heart of wisdom. So how do we shine up our soul? How do we make it so that our lives are filled with meaning and that we count every day, that we wake up every day and say, what will today bring? How do we do that in the face of the truth that we are aging, we're getting older? So what I want to offer to all of you is that we live in a culture, in a community that has a declinist view of aging. And I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that. And how can we turn that instead into a spiritual view of aging? They're very different things. And one great source for all of you I want to share, it is um, a, an old book. It's a classic, Wise Aging. And it was written by two really wise women. Maybe some of you know Rabbi Rachel Cowan, Zichona Livracha. She passed away way too young before she could actually show us how wisely she would age. And Dr. Linda Thal, who still in New York City runs uh, wise aging groups. Uh, it's a whole movement of turning the declinist view into a spiritual view of aging. So what, what do I mean by the declinist view? It's the fact that as we age, we face the attitude toward aging that's everywhere in our society. So it informs the way we think of ourselves and the way others behave toward us. It's actually reflected in social policy. It's in the great infrastructure that promotes ageism in America today, leaving millions of senior citizens without resources they need for their health and well being. Some of you may be here on this screen that there's an inequity in access to, to um, Medicare resources, to the health system. Um, so many senior citizens live with food insecurity, and some of you may be here on the screen today. Um, as I was waiting for the class to begin, I was listening to a couple of the people in the class just chatting briefly about needing access to the medical system in the time of I imagine is an emergency, something unexpected. And any of us who are of a certain age remember that the doctor used to come to our house, used to come and take care of us. And we didn't have to worry about access to that medical care with a black bag, right? And um, I remember having measles as a kid and wallowing in my mother's and father's bed and Dr. Mallet coming with his black bag to take care of me. But in our culture today, it's not just ageism, it's just the sense of our culture that valorizes youth and strength and beauty, everything. Is. And we who are older, we don't manifest those qualities as we once did. And with sinking hearts, we start thinking perhaps we are invisible. 
People who used to ask our advice perhaps no longer do. We see even in our families perhaps that our kids are now telling us the what for, what we need to know. They're, they're telling us how we have to live and what kinds of decisions we need to make. And we're afraid of losing ourselves to that. This is the declinist view. So the declinist view has all kinds of adjectives. If you ask a group of like, I don't know, college kids, describe elders to, to me, unless they have an amazing bubby or softo or grandfather or poppy, right? Where they know the opposite is true. They might say things like frail, dependent, lacking in judgment, unattractive, conservative, slow drivers, sickly, right? absent-minded, depressive, right? All these really negative um, stereotypes. And I want to tell you, these stereotypes are not just in young people. We've lived with them all of our lives and we take them in and assume them about ourselves and our peers. Though there are some magical people among us um, and maybe some of them are you who say things like, oh, I don't want to go to that discussion group with all those Alta Cockers, right? I'm not one of them. I'm not an older person like that. I don't, I'm still very young in my heart. And I always like to tell the story that Grandpa Lou's wife was my grandma Blanche. And I remember her, I was a teenager and she said something like, I don't know. I look in the mirror, I see who I am, but in my head, I'm still 16. And I looked at her, I thought, Oh, she's insane. What is she? She was probably 55 at the time, right? And I'm like, 16, what is she talking about? She's such an old lady. And today, well, in a million years, I wouldn't want to be 16 again. I do feel like, what does this mean that I'm 65? Like, it just, it can't be. I feel like I'm just not that in my heart, in my soul. So that brings us to countering the declinist view with a spiritual view of aging. And this spiritual view says that we have to shift from a deficiency kind of model to a growth motivation model. What do we mean by this? Aging can be an opportunity for growth, discovery, and new meaning. We can shed the stuff that holds us back, that occupied our minds and our time when we were younger, foolish things that we worried about. And instead, we can live more deeply and turn away from superficiality. We can cultivate a deeper, more spiritual view of life because we have time and wisdom and a soul with which to do that. So how do we do that? What does that mean? And am I just talking pie in the sky? I don't know. I, I'm a person who has never worn makeup. I've, I never made up my face. But even, even without that, I used to walk out every day. I'm a very public person. I'm a rabbi in a community. Before that, as a social worker, I worked in a day school and I worked in a geriatric center in West Orange, New Jersey. By the way, that was the secret of staying young in my 20s and 30s because everyone thought I was a Shana Madeleff. And when you're a beautiful young woman in the eyes of older people, it keeps you feeling very young. But through all that time, I'm a public person. And now I'm still a public person. But guess what? I don't want to come out into the world looking ugly. I just don't care anymore. I'm not looking for whether people are looking at my face. I want to connect to people through my eyes with my soul. That is the spiritual aging process. And I wanna tell you how I know this to be true. Like many of you, perhaps, I have been present at the moment of death. I've actually been present at the moment of death many times, first in my work in the geriatric center, now as a rabbi with family members. And if you've ever been present in that moment, perhaps you have been blessed enough to see the way this person whose body is diminishing becomes shining, their soul starts glowing. I've seen this many times and I know it to be true because I've seen the moment that the soul leaves the body, leaving behind the exhausted body. And I then look and see that the person is no longer there before me. For me, it is an absolute belief in the soul. And I see that as people are beginning to leave us, 
their soul becomes shinier and shinier. And so I say, why wait until we're on our deathbed for that to happen? Why wait until the time turns and we find ourselves no longer living? We can be busy shining up our soul every single day. I I believe this with my whole with my whole heart. So what is it that gets in the way of being spiritual in the way we age rather than uh, seeing ourselves declining, declining? It's loss, isn't it? It's about loss because we have a declinist view. We look around, we say, my best friend is no longer alive. The restaurants I used to love to go to have too many stairs. I can't go there anymore. I used to have a position where I walked into the room, people were like, oh, here she comes. This is the person who knows how to solve all the problems and that doesn't happen anymore. I used to make Passover Seder for 60 and I can't do that anymore. I had to turn it over to my daughter-in-law and God knows her matzo balls are terrible, right? Whatever it is, it's a declinist view. We can't do the things. There's been so many losses. So I want to take those losses on directly. I don't want to be pie in the sky with you and and say that, you know, none of this um, is meaningful. Just put on a happy face and know that your soul is getting wiser. You're getting older, but don't worry about it. No, I want to look at like straight in the eyes and say, yes, there is loss all around us. But many of us, I mean, I know Leonard Cohen has become everywhere in the world. He's like, really, we're all talking about I like to call him Rabbi Leonard Cohen, but in his beautiful poem song, The Anthem, he says, there's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And I'd like to think, and I'd like to say that when we've had extreme difficulties in our life, they can be seen as opportunities for growth. So I'm wondering, and if you want to, put it into the into the uh, chat, or if you want to just write it for yourself, what's challenging in your life today? What kinds of losses are you dealing with? What kinds of things have been hard for you? It might be loss of friendship. It might be loss of identity, loss of health, loss of spouse, loss of best friend, loss of children. I mean, we get to a certain age, we have losses out of order, right? So what's been hard for you? You can throw it into the into the chat if you want. It's fine with me if you write it just for yourself. I, I just hope you'll think about it so it becomes real for you. So whatever your losses are, I'd like to offer three different ways that we approach losses, three, three different choices, actually, that we can make. The first choice is to assume that growth happens from a complete shattering. I'm not saying that we have a tragic loss and then all of a sudden we come, we become a better person or a bigger person. God knows we'd rather not have that loss. But when the loss is experienced, do we grow from it? Can we become what Dr. Ann Brenner calls a wounded healer? We've been through cancer and we become the person that every person we know says, oh, call my friend. She's been through cancer. She can talk you through it. Have we lost a partner and then found new love again because we realize that the love planted in us, we're not breaking any loyalty pledge by finding love again. Have we managed to go through a shattering and come through it brighter, larger than we were, more wise than we were in our lives? And yes, there are some breaks that are never healed, but that's what Leonard Cohen's talking about. It's the cracks where the light comes in. Right. So in our lives, I'm sure we can think of people who have had unthinkable tragedy and still the light comes through. So at the very beginning of this class, I mentioned that um, since my bio that Dr. Nevins offered, we've had a third grandchild. 
His name is Geffen Nadav. And Nadav is for my son-in-law's dearest friend who was murdered together with his oldest child on October 7th. His wife, Nadav's wife and three children were kidnapped into Gaza and they were returned in, in about the third day of the ceasefire. They all came home. They knew that Nadav and their oldest child, Yam, had been murdered. They knew before they were taken into captivity. And Sagi wrote to Chen, the widow, and said, we've named our child Geffen Nadav. And she wrote back that this was the first light, the first whisper of healing that she, thank you, that she and her family have experienced through the shattering and then the gift of my son-in-law and daughter naming Geffen Nadav for Nadav, there's been a healing. This is how the light gets in. So the first choice is we recognize that through a shattering, we can grow more bright, more knowledgeable, more wise. We can take what life has given us and grow because to sit in why me forever is going down into the declinist view. It is a depressive way to live our lives. Some people don't have resilience to overcome it, but if you are able to overcome it and you turn away from why me and say, well, why not me? Who, who gets through this life without turbulence and breakage and sorrow and loss? That's one way to look at loss. A second, a second way to look at loss is to just say, I want to go through them and not be undone by them. So at the top level is we're going to grow and learn. We're going to make a decision, a conscious decision. I'm going to, I'm going to live through this and grow from it. Those are all the people who experience pancreatic cancer and then go run the pan can race every day every year, excuse me. Those are the people who have um, lost a child to SIDS, God forbid, or lost a child to, um, you know, um, a, a stillbirth. And then they grieve and suffer and go through it and then become those parents who reach out to others and are helpful, right? That's the first. The second is, let me just get through it. And those are the people who say, yeah, I had breast cancer. That is in my rearview mirror and I'm going forward. It's not a terrible way to live. It's useful and it allows us to continue living, but perhaps it doesn't allow for this spiritual growth that I'm talking about. And then, of course, the third option, which I know is highly tempting, is to hold ourselves at emotional distance from what's really going on in our lives. These are people who get up every day drink their coffee, go about their business, take their walk in the park, they're going to notice it's a beautiful day, but they're not going to be reflective. They're not going to look for insight in their own world. They're just going to say, this is my life. This is my life. And it's a not a terrible way to live. You get up every day, you're a good person, but you're not growing spiritually. You're missing an opportunity. My guess is that there's no one on this Zoom class right now who is living that way, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be looking for how to age well. So in addition to what's challenging in your life, what losses you've experienced, my other question is, what are you curious about today? What still is of interest to you? And if you don't want to write it down now, you can just write it for a prompt and think about it later or call your friend after and say, oh, Let's go to the museum at Eldridge Street, uh, Street on uh, December 25th for that amazing concert. Let me tell you about the class I took today. And the teacher asked, what am I curious about today? What are you curious about today? How do you fuse klezmer with Chinese music? I'm curious about that. How will our next generation use AI to solve the problems of climate change? I'm curious about that. How is it possible for me, who's never been a spiritual person, never identified myself like that, to start thinking about the spiritual view of aging instead of the declinist view? So these ideas of loss may feel sort of 
pie in the sky to you. I can grow from it. I can go through it. I can avoid it. I can just sort of become, you know, with a nice armor around me. But when we think about Leonard Cohen and we think about the cracks are where the light comes in, I invite you to think about any time in your life when you have felt connected to something greater than you. For me, I call it God. Not everyone calls it God. That's fine. Maybe it's been when you've been um, hiking upstate New York. Maybe you've gone to the Berkshires and stood on a hilltop and looked down at a lake and just felt like, whoa, I am not the end all and be all. There's something bigger than me. Maybe it's sitting in a synagogue. Maybe it's visiting the museum at Eldridge Street. I've been there. Eldridge Street is amazing to understand what it meant to those new immigrants to be in this place that was larger than life and remembered life is not all just your tiny little tenement. Maybe you have felt close to something greater than you when you have come through loss and asked for help out into the universe and felt somehow you are not alone. I'll share with you that what kicked my tushy into rabbinical school at age 39, after having a great career as a social worker and four kids, what was I thinking of? I live in New Jersey to start commuting for six years back into JTS. What was I thinking? It was the time when I lost my mom and I was all alone. I moved back to Maine with my youngest baby who was five months old when she died. And I just moved in with her to take care of her. I was so alone. It was the hardest period of time in my life. I was close to my mom. My dad had already died. And this was my last parent. I became an orphan way too young. And also, I felt so close to God. With loss, the light comes through those cracks. And it can be a time of enormous growth. So it may be my own personal experience that makes me think that, but I offer it to you with an open hand to take and think about what did happen to me when I lost a parent or lost my job or lost my marriage? Was there growth? If I look back on my life, do I see that those losses led me to something bigger and newer? And I'd like to offer a beloved psalm that I think we all know to try to help us answer this question. Here we are. Who doesn't know and love Psalm 23? We're not going to study the whole thing. I just want to look together at the places where I've bolded. It begins like we know at a Nairoi, right? The Lord is my shepherd, loach sai, shall not want. God gives me rest in green pastures and leads me beside still water. God restores my soul. God guides me in straight paths for God's name's sake. For those of you who um, don't use God language, just talk about a force greater than you are and don't worry about it. But I want to say that Psalms are usually prescriptive, not descriptive. It doesn't mean that we rest in green pastures and that we are led beside still waters. It doesn't mean that God restores my soul. It's like the Jewish chutzpah, God, this is what I want from you. I'm prescribing to God what I need. I'm not describing what I always have. So it's an affirmative kind of speech, but look what I've bolded. Though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. What does that mean? Who's the you? If you read the psalm semantically, literally, it's pretty clear. And you can see I capitalized the why of you. The psalmist is talking about God. But I think that also we could read this as the people of our life. I walk in the shadow of death. I fear no evil for you, my peeps, my people who I love my friends, my partner, my children, my great-grandchildren, whoever it is, my nieces, my cousins, the people who have been in my world, you're with me. The people who have been with me and have gone before me, my parents, my grandparents. Some of us have a Nana, Grandma, Bubby, Zadie, who is always planted in us, not just in our DNA, but in the way we think and the way we see the world. You 
are with me. That's why I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death, which let's face it, is the whole world. And I don't fear. Nothing's going to happen to me that is untoward or unprepared because you are with me. This is a great way to think about aging spiritually. I recognize that I'm mortal and I am not afraid of that. Maybe, remember I asked the question about curious? Maybe I am even curious about what comes next. Not that I seek death, God forbid. Not that I welcome death. I want one more day and one more day and one more day, even when the days are hard. But perhaps I can say, I am not afraid. I'm going to make today count. I'm going to make tomorrow count every day that I'm given. And I may in my elder years be in a wheelchair, lose my vision. I may lose a lot of my memory. I can still grow spiritually. That's the gift of a spiritual view of aging. How many of us have visited people who are older and marveled at their acceptance and their wisdom? What is it that they have? They have the view of aging spiritually rather than focusing on all the loss. We have certainly also been in the presence of those who have a declinist view of aging. And I would say that's probably the majority of us because we live in a culture that really emphasizes beauty and youth and and accomplishment and setting goals and you know persevering winning the marathon and still i'd rather be with those people who accept that as they age what they have to grow with is their soul um i'd rather be with them any day some days i have the declinist view i can't pretend I don't. We were talking about COVID before the class began. Like if you've been homesick, you need to have a pity party. You need to say, poor me, woe is me. This is a really hard day. I'm just feeling lousy and I don't want to eat anything. I don't want to see anyone. I want to be by myself and my body's breaking apart and I wish I were fen you know, 16 again. But most days we can choose to have the capacity to say, what will happen today that will enliven my mind, my heart, my soul? What, what new thing will happen for me today? So I wanted to just share from this book, this beautiful book um, by Thal and by Cowan, um, this idea of the challenges that happen when we grow older. As we anticipate the losses and pain of old age, our imagination is fertile. We picture the loss of body strength and capacity, the deterioration of health, as well as the dislocation from our place of residence. So I forgot to mention that one. The prospect of the loss of status and satisfactions of the roles we've enjoyed disheartens us. And we dread those terrible diminishments of mental capacity. You can make your own list. And finally, we fear the death of friends and relatives and most darkly our own mortality. But I like to say, and she wrote, but we also know that we can cultivate the spiritual practices that will help us live well through the hard places. We can nurture and strengthen important relationships. We can call on our character traits, which Judaism calls midot, right? Our attributes to hold us steadier. And we can cultivate new ones like faith and mindfulness and prayer, whether formal, spontaneous, or poetic. We can develop a capacity for self-forgiveness, forgiveness of others. We can set ourselves small mini goals to grow our souls every single day. And we, my friends, can age wisely. I want to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions. So I want to um, share my screen one more time and show you first that psalm again. My cup overflows. 
it says in bold, here I am. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. What, what does this say about the Jewish view of grief? We are walking in the valley of the shadow of death. I'm sure you all know this is like the number one psalm recited at bedsides of the ailing. It's recited at funerals. When people say, I need a psalm to give me comfort, it's offered as comfort. But what does this say about the Jewish view of the diminishment through aging? What does this say about the terrible, terrible view of life as simply diminishment? It says, my cup overflows. The best is yet to be. So I used to run. I'm never running a marathon. I never did. I ran a half marathon. I wanted to run a marathon. I'm never going to do it. I used to swim. I was on the swim team back in college. I'm never going to swim a mile just as a warm up again. Never going to happen. I'm never going to dance Zumba for three hours again. Not happening. And I'm probably never going to publish the great American novel. Pretty much sure that boat has sailed. But my cup overflows because of my internal life, because of the insight into myself that I insist on continuing to gather, because what I see as my goal at this time in my life is growing my relationship with the people who give me sucker, who make me think, who remind me to be curious. I have jettisoned, jettisoned those people who pull me down. I take care of some of them professionally. Some of them are in my family life. I'm sure they're in yours too. I'm not the only one with an Aunt Sheila who is just a downer. I don't cut her off. She's in my life. I don't allow her to permeate me anymore. I choose the people who allow me to see that my cup overflows. I write poetry. It's not very good. I write it for me and for my grandchildren. And one day I think they'll love it because it's about them. I write in a journal really often. I collage. I sketch poorly, but I do it because it allows me to meditate and I pray Okay, so it's in my job description to pray every day. I admit it. And it doesn't have to be the matbeah tefillah, the prayer that is dictated to Jewish people or whatever religion you are. It can be simply making sure you get your body outside every day if you are able, or at least looking out a window every day if you're not able to get outside and saying, who painted this beautiful sunset? And if you're like my three-year-old grandson, Carmel, you will say, God painted the sky. To me, that is the way that we age spiritually. Here is my final prayer for all of you. It's in the words of the great philosopher, Martin Buber. Every person born into this world represents something new, something that never existed before, something original and unique. There has never been someone like them in the world, for if there had been, there would be no need for them to be in the world. Every single person is a new thing in the world and is called upon to fulfill their particularity. And so I leave you with this question. What is your unique gift to this world? What do you bring that if you weren't in this world, the world would be substantially different. And when you work on answering that question, you will age gracefully, you will age spiritually. And while things do diminish, I hope I have not led you astray into a Pollyanna view, your soul will grow brighter and brighter. People will be attracted to you because you know that you are in this world for a purpose. And then perhaps we can all fulfill our three greatest hopes, whatever they are today. 
I'm going to take Margot's with me into the world today. Maybe you will too. They were her hopes at 11.10 a.m. By 11.57, she may have other hopes, but she has as her hopes, purpose, love, and contribution. It's the answer to the question, why am I here today? What is my great purpose? So I'd love to leave it open to anyone who wants to reflect. If you want to write something in the chat, if you want to unmute and share something, if this all sounds like a bunch of bugaboo, or if indeed you're willing to take on a spiritual view of aging instead of a diminishment view, I open it up to you. Michael. You call it spiritual. I call it attitude. I want to give you three examples of people in my life with positive attitude. Last week, cousin Myrtle died at age 100 in a nursing home in Santa Barbara. She died having probably the world record for the longest case of severe Alzheimer's, 29 years in a nursing home with severe Alzheimer's. And every day she was brought uh, to the nurse's station in a wheelchair with a smile on her face. And she was smiling when she died last week. There was a man in Rockland County, his name was Ed Simons. He was the head of the Rockland County uh, Orchestra. It led the orchestra at age 100. His daughter, when he died, I think at 102 a few years ago, the title of her memoir of her father was He Woke Every Morning with a Smile. My partner, my lady friend for over 16 years, last week had a, a stroke. Um, yesterday, I took her to her cardiologist and neurologist in, Lo in Manhattan. And as a physician, I was so concerned with her rehab, how to prevent a, another one from coming. But Linda is the most positive person I've ever met. She always has a smile. She inspires people because she's got such a positive attitude. She's not a, a what I would call, certainly not a religious person, but... You know, as we were walking from the cardiologist to the neurologist, her attitude, whereas I was gloomy, she was saying, oh, I dodged a bullet. I'm going to take a month off and I'm going to be fine and I'm going to return to my very busy life. Well, she's only 82. She hasn't gotten to 100 yet, but God bless her. Maybe she will. But, you know, so whether it's spiritual or attitude, it's something intrinsic. And I think that, as you say, that is, everybody has their own way of accomplishing that, but uh, not to be a downer, but to be an upper is, is the, the true secret. Right. Getting older is a blessing and it happens. Getting old is a choice. Even I, you're describing your cousin Myrtle even with the diminishment of our emotions and our memory, those things that we think make us us, um, there's still the soul. And it was her soul shining out to that nurse's station every single day. I just put into the chat um, one of my blog posts from last May um, called Hanging with Nonagenarians. I just love old people. I'm <laughs> I'm now the old people too. I. I started a group at my synagogue when I first came there called Chazak. It was for people 65 and older. And I was like Julie, the cruise director. And now I am the Chazak, right? I am that age. Thank God. But I've always looked to people older than me. And if you, um, it's just like what Michael just shared. It's a four different people who offer a beautiful, uplifting outlook. And then you can say to yourself, I want to be like them. How can I do that? How can I do that? Thank you, Michael, for those beautiful biographies of your people in your life. Thank you.
So I see a number of individuals uh, thanking you for the uh, 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 talk, Rabbi Gill. Uh, R. H. Levin writes, thank you, a wonderful session. I've been caring today for an ailing patient and so multitasking has kept me from fully participating. Looking forward to reviewing the recording. Uh, Marsha Lawner says, wonderful, inspirational talk. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, Margot Cates writes, this has been a wonderful, inspiring, and very grounded presentation. I thank you. I will thank everyone for coming. Thank you for the wonderful presentation again. Dr. Nevins, thank you so much for the fantastic uh, series and presentation for the entire series. Uh, I, we hope everyone has enjoyed. We look forward to seeing you again, whether you can come for the Christmas Day concert or not with us here at the museum at Eldridge Street. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.